clock. Yep, you got it. Okay, and I think we're recording, so I will start now. Okay, so everyone, hello and welcome. My name is Aaron Essery. I am the Assistant Extension Specialist for Enology and Viticulture here at Oklahoma State University. And today we're going to discuss oak barrels and their role in winemaking. So let us begin. So why do we oak wine? It adds complexity. Uh, simply put, it affects the taste, mouthfeel, body, aroma, and tannins. And it's a traditional way to mature wine. All, all red wines can receive oak, um, but very few white wines can or should receive oak. Uh, Chardonnay is usually a good candidate for white wine oaking. I don't know about hybrids. I don't, I've never experimented with white hybrids oaking wine, uh, so it's yet to be determined. Hello. If you're just joining us, we are, we are just started, uh, and so this was the very first slide. So how oak barrels came to be. Uh, traditionally, just people needed a simple way to store and transport wine and the barrel was the way to do it. Uh, it's believed the barrel was originated by the Celts and then adapted by the Romans, BC times, around about 300 B BC. So barrels have been around for literally thousands of years. After storing wine in barrels, people noticed and liked the taste that it gave to wine. And so it has since become a traditional means of storing and aging and maturing wine. So just out of necessity, barrels became a part of the winemaking uh, regime. Many different types of oak or many different types of wood were trialed, uh, oak, beech, ash, pine, anything they could make a barrel from. Uh, but it was found through time that oak was the preferred wood of choice. So how oak influences wood? I mean, how oak influences wine? Oak is a tertiary attribute, uh, meaning that it's the third part of the puzzle to influence wine and its ageability. The grape berry itself is the primary factor influencer. The yeast, your yeast selection you use is the secondary factor. And then oak is the tertiary factor. And a combination of all three will make a different wine completely. You know, so let's say you have Chamberson grape, and then I pick alchemy three yeast, and then I pick French oak. And that combination will give you a unique style of wine. Um, a very simple diagram of how it works, like you have your, your chain of tannins and you can have your color compounds and then through time with oak, they just integrate. That's called ageability or maturing the wine and you form these longer and longer chains as time goes on and it just helps, uh, helps with mouthfeel. The oak barrel itself will allow teeny tiny amounts of oxygen to slowly incorporate into the wine over time. And this does help with tannin structure and uh, color structure with ageability. And I'm talking small, small, small parts of oxygen. I mean, oxygen is normally, oxygen is detrimental to wine in large doses if you leave it out. But in oak barrel, it's, it's the perfect, perfect way to do it. So types of oak. Um, corcus, that's the genus. Corcus is oak. So if you see corcus, botanically speaking, that's oak. There's three main types, French oak, American oak, and Eastern European oak. French oak is considered the premium for oak and winemaking. That's subjective, but it's also kind of understood too. A lot of people agree French oak is usually the best. French oak uh, is made from Corcus robur and Corcus patria. I'm pretty sure I'm mispronouncing that, but Corcus robur, Corcus patria, those are the species of oak used. French oak is in parts a softer and more velvety mouthfeel. Uh, the cost of a barrel though is northward of $1,000. So they're not cheap. Um, and they come from France. These, these trees are from the French forest. They're made in, well, they're not made in France, but they're French wood. Uh, and they can be made wherever, but French oak is oak from France, you know, and it's usually considered premium. American oak, that's much less expensive, about half the cost. But American oak is made from a complete different species, as you'll see, Corcus alba. That's French oak. I mean, that's American oak. Corcus alba is white oak, American oak. Um, it imparts a more tannic mouthfeel. So French oak gives you softer velvety. American oak is more tannin, you know, just more tannic. Um, again, the cost is about half, though. And it's all grown here. Missouri grows a lot of 
Oak, uh, Kentucky, California, Washington, uh, maybe some here in Oklahoma too. Um, but then the third option, Eastern European Oak, and it implies the name just as it sounds. That's Oak from Romania, Hungary, Croatia, Slovenia, Eastern Europe. The funny thing about Eastern European Oak is that it's, it's the same exact species of tree as the French Oak. So is there similar attributes? That's up for debate. Some people say it is, some people say it isn't. I don't know. I, if it's the same species to me, it's gotta be the same attributes. Um, <clears throat> cost is about three to $400 less per barrel. So Eastern European is maybe a good alternative um, if you're trying to simulate French oak. Uh, American oak is definitely a different species. So it's, that is different, but French and European oak are, are very, very similar. On a side note, colder growing conditions make for tighter wood grain, and I'll get to that now. So grain tightness in oak barrels. Obviously, oak barrels come from trees, and trees are living organisms that grow from the earth. Well, a slower or a colder growing condition will make for a slower growing tree. And when these trees grow slower, their growth rings in between each grain, it gets tighter. And a tighter grain is actually more porous. Like, it's funny enough, but tighter grain is more porous. And that has to do with sap shooting through the, through the, through the tree, you know, as it's, as it's coming out of dorm dormancy. And it's these sap that create these holes and allow for minerals and aromas. Anyway, these pores allow for better integration of aroma and minerals into wine. And, and this is pretty, you know, scientific in terms of an oak barrel, but you'll see on the bottom left picture, uh, there's open grain and then there's tight grain. So that early wood is spring growth. That's when the tree breaks dormancy and it's pushing sap. That late wood is summer growth. And when you have warmer, longer summers, you have more growth. You can see it gets, it gets wider in diameter. You compound this over many, many years. And if you look at the bottom right picture, you can see that these two, the top one being open grain, the bottom one being tight grain, the top band is six-year-old tree and the bottom band is an 11-year-old tree and you can see they're the same diameter. Even though they're the same diameter, the bottom one would be 11 years old. You have more pores, tighter grain, it's better integration into wine. Uh, so if you ever have a choice, like you're buying oak barrels from a, from a company, if they off, if they say you want open grain or tight grain, go with tight grain. It's, it's, it's better scientifically speaking. So little little neat fact there. Okay, toast levels. So when you buy an oak barrel, you have the option of toasts. Um, and toasting is, you can see that uh, little picture there, top right corner. Toasting levels uh, is literally charring the inside of a barrel over an open flame. And this improves flavor. I don't really know how it came to be or who discovered it or why, but Somewhere along the way, barrel making, people realized if you burn the inside of a barrel or char it just enough, it, it helps with the aromas and flavors. So there's different levels, light, medium, medium plus, and heavy toast. And each toast level will offer a different type of attribute. You know, heavy, heavy toast is like molasses, and butterscotch, and very smoky. Light toast is clove and flowers and herbs and coconut. And then vanilla is some, I mean, uh, medium is a, somewhere in between with, with a lot of vanilla. Medium and medium plus are usually the most common toast found in wineries for wine barrels because they're the most versatile, you know. But fun fact. Okay, barrel life. So oak barrels actually do have a lifespan. And then ha this has to do with the number of times and the amount of wine, the duration of wine and the amount of wine that go into it. Um, if you have a brand new oak barrel, and you put 60 gallons of wine in it, which is common. 59, 60 are usually the volume of a wine of an oak barrel. That first brand new wine that goes into the barrel will pick up about half of that oak that that barrel will give um, from about you know eight to 12 months or so. That first use is the best. You pull that wine out, clean it. You put a second wine in. Well, after that second wine has been in barrel for a few months, half a year maybe to to a full year. Only 30% of that oak has gone in there, is left. You pull it out, clean the barrel, use it. 
About your third use, you that barrel now only has about 15% of oak attributes left that it can impart in wine. And after the fourth use, it's almost non-existent. So if you have barrels and you've been putting wine in it like multiple times over multiple years, they're probably neutral now. After, after four plus uses of wine going into a barrel and coming out of a barrel, the oak has been used up. The, the wine has, has taken all the oak attributes it can from that barrel and the barrel is now considered neutral and it won't impart any more oak flavors or characteristics into wine. You can still use it as a storage vessel and you can even like drop alternative oaks in there to, to help with it. I'll get to that later on. But um, four uses is pretty much the lifespan of a barrel. After that, you either have to recondition it, which involves breaking it down, cleaning it, scraping it, exposing fresh wood, and I'll get to that too later, or uh, using it as a storage vessel or just using it to decorate your winery. I mean, there's uses for it, but it's, it's no longer going to impart any oak into your wine after about four uses. Uh, the first use is always the best. In fact, there's some wineries that claim they use 200% new oak, which involves putting wine into a barrel for a first use, pulling it out, and then putting that same wine into a brand new barrel again to pick up even more fresh oak. It's a, it's a crazy way to do it, but some wineries actually do it. They call it 200% you know, new oak. Just know that barrels do have a, do have a lifespan. Okay, barrel anatomy and style. Uh, this is just more practical than scientific, but um, there's two main types. There is a Bordeaux style and a Burgundy style. The Bordeaux style is longer and narrower, and the Burgundy style is shorter and wider, and usually has about three more liters you can fit into a barrel. There's no difference in the oak. Uh, it's just the shape. And I don't know why. I mean, when barrels were being built and used in winemaking, Burgundy made a style and Bordeaux made a style, and they couldn't agree on which is best, so the two regions just kept producing barrels. And this is what we have today. And you'll, you'll find, I mean, I've, I've only ever seen these two styles in a winery uh, in terms of wine storage. So it's important to know though, if you have these barrels, keep the same shape on the same rack. And that has to do with stacking. And I'll get to that in a minute too, because if you have different barrels, one is different shape, they just, it, it stacks badly. So keep Bordeaux barrels together, keep Burgundy barrels together and stack, try to stack the same barrels with each other. Uh, just barrel anatomy. Barrels are made up of staves. Staves are just the long slats that are held together by hoops. Uh, you have the bilge, which is the big center part that's traditionally there for rolling. So before they had equipment, they would just roll barrels on the bilge. The bung hole, uh, the bung, and then the hoops. The head, technically it's called a head. It's not the barrel ends, it's the barrel head. You just want to be specific. Uh, that sits inside of a crow's, which is just a notch cut in the staves. Um, and what I think is cool, these staves are actually only held together by physics. They're not held together by glue. There's no dowel rods in between them. They are just sheer wood wedged together in a barrel shape with hoops. Um, it's really neat. I've broken down a barrel before and that's all there is. It's just wood and hoops. And I just, I just think it's really neat. Okay. So stacking barrels. Um, two main ways to stack barrels. On the left, you can see is traditional pyramid stacking. It looks really neat and it's cool, but it's much more cumbersome to do um, because, well, one, you're lifting them manually and that's just, it gets heavy. First off, you, I don't know of anyone who can lift a full wine barrel. Full wine barrels are about 600 pounds a piece. And so to stack them in a pyramid, you would have to put the first layer down, fill them, stack the second layer, fill them, stack the third layer, fill them. So it's, it's, it's really tedious and cumbersome. And then, you know, heaven forbid, if you ever had to get to a middle or bottom barrel, you have to take all the top ones off. And it can just, you know, aside from traditional aesthetics, it's, it's just a lot of work. On the right, you can see uh, stacking with racks is much more common and practical. Uh, two barrels per rack, and these racks are a forklift width apart. You just drive your forks in, pick up the rack, move them. I mean, that's always how I've done stack maneuver barrels or on racks. Uh, really only stack four to five racks high because after about the fifth rack, it's like, you know, 15 feet in the air. And so just be careful. Um, you'll notice too here, there's a leaning rack and that has to do with mismatched barrels. Uh, and mismatched barrels on the same rack can be bad news, especially if you're going 
you know, four, five, six racks high, it starts to look like the Leaning Tower of Pisa, then it's just, it can be scary. So always make sure you have the same type of barrels on the same rack for stacking. Which brings me to this one. Be careful stacking your barrels. I did not do this, nor did I take this picture. I've only found this online, but this looks like a bad day and a half for someone. Um, somebody knocked down an entire tower of barrels and it created a domino effect. Don't <laughs> be careful stacking. Um, I mean, again, these barrels full are about 600 pounds. And so if that comes crashing down on you, you're done. So be careful. If you got a forklift and you have barrels in a warehouse, take your time, uh, you know, try to get forklift certified drivers, no distractions, go slow and do not do this. Be careful stacking barrels. So storing barrels. So it's best to store barrels between 55 degrees and 65 degrees Fahrenheit with 65% to 75% humidity. Now, these are just textbook numbers. I have never worked at a winery that actually could control the humidity. You, controlling temperature is a, is a big deal. You need to be able to control your temperature, but I've, I've, never, I've never controlled humidity in a, in a barrel storage facility before. Um, but by the numbers, that's the best place to store them. You want to avoid temperature fluctuations too. Like if you can only store barrels at 70, 75 degrees, that's fine, but just keep it at 70, 75 degrees. Don't go back and forth. Um, and then light or dark room doesn't matter. You just want to avoid the direct sun. So don't store barrels in direct sunlight, even if it's through a window, like, you know, peering into a barrel. It just, it can lead to, to yeah, spoilage, really. So uh, it doesn't matter if it's light or dark room, just no direct sun. So cleaning wine barrels. Now we're really into the, to the cellar work. Um, it's not easy to clean a wine barrel. They, they can be, they can be a cha well, not a challenge, but it just takes time and, and, and a thorough, it takes really a thorough effort to clean a barrel. Um, again, barrels are very porous and are raw wood. So it's, it's straight wood from a tree. They're, they're, they're dried and seasoned, but they're, they're not slacker. There's no, there's no coating on the inside of a barrel. It's, it's raw wood. Uh, so they need to be cleaned. Hot water is a must. You need hot water to clean barrels. If you're cleaning with cold water, you're only just rinsing. Hot water is a, a must. Um, clean barrels, well, barrels can last a long time if properly cleaned and sanitized. Uh, and then also note that Britannomyces, uh, which is a spoiled yeast, can live inside of barrels. So it's always important to clean them, you know, properly clean them, sanitize them as best you can. So how do you clean a wine barrel? Uh, again, hot water, can't emphasize that enough. You need hot water. Uh, there's three, as far as I know, three real types. There's what I call a ball cleaner, which is these first top two pictures here. Um, it's like a, a simple piece, I say a simple piece, but it's a, it's a piece of, of hollow pipe that has a spinning ball head on the end, uh, bent in a 90 degree angle. I call it a ball cleaner. I don't, there's probably a proper name for it. That's what I've referred to it as. Um, you, you pretty much just hook up a water source, whether it be a hot water, hot water hose or a hot water pressure washer, you hook it to the end, and then you turn the barrel upside down on a rack, wedge it up under there and just blast it with hot water. And that ball head will just spin and spin and clean and clean. And you just, you go until it, it starts looking clear. Cleaning wine barrels, you'll see the red, red wine, well not red wine, but red color water will come out and then it gets clear and it is clearer and clearer. And you go until it's, until it's clear. Um, the second one is just a hot pressure washer, hot water pressure washer. Um, you can blast the inside with a hot, hot water pressure washer, turn it upside down, drain it, turn it back over, do it again. I've done that method too. Um, just be careful not to gouge the outside of the wood. It's okay to blast the inside all day long. In fact, you want to, you want to blast the inside, get it clean, expose some fresh wood if you can, uh, and then turn it upside down, let it drip. The bottom right picture is a steam generator, and it's a it's about a wand that's maybe a foot or 18 inches long and you just put it down in the bung, in the bung hole and you steam it. And steam probably is the best way to clean it, uh, but it's also expensive and requires three, pay, three phase power. Um, they're very specific pieces of equipment, but again, probably the best way to clean a wine barrel in my opinion. And I've done all three of these before. I mean, they're, you know, if you just be thorough and you can get them clean using all three methods. Once they are clean, 
You can add tartaric acid and potassium metabisulfite in a water solution and store them for months on end like that. And it's good to store barrels filled with something, whether it be water or wine. Um, if you leave them without any type of liquid in there, they tend to dehydrate and they'll they'll not fall apart, but the hoops will become loose. And it, you know, because barrels swell, they're they're porous and they swell. They need water to keep them turgid, keep them swollen. Um, just be sure to you know, cycle that water through every six months or a year or so. You don't want to leave KMBS and tartaric acid in there indefinitely. It'll, it'll make like a rotten egg smell. Um, sodium percarbonate can be used to clean barrels, but be sure to rinse that thoroughly. Sodium percarbonate is the main ingredient in OxyClean, and it will do a good job cleaning, no doubt, but you just don't want to touch that to your wine next. So if you are going to use sodium percarbonate, soak it for, fill it up with water, soak it for about 48 hours, and then dump it and rinse it, uh, clean it again with tartaric acid, and then rinse it and rinse it again. Just make sure you get all that sodium percarbonate out, you know, before you, before you use it again. There we go. Okay, that brings me to topping, barrel topping. So let's say you have wine in a barrel and you seal it, fill it full, put it away. Wine will naturally evaporate with time. This is a term called eulage, uh, also known as the angel share. It's a natural phenomenon that happens. You can fill a barrel completely full to the brim, bung it, seal it, put it away, come back in three months, and it, wine will have evaporated out. It, it just it naturally happens. So that, makes, that leads you to top barrels. And topping is putting more wine into the barrel to fill it up. Um, it's best to top barrels every two to three months. Uh, every quarter is okay, but topping once a year is not enough, in my opinion. Uh, if you are topping once a year, I would encourage you to at least do it twice a year and then try strive for every quarter if you can. Um, topping is a good time to taste and smell your wine and also check it chemically, check pH, TA, free SO2, add KMBS if needed. Um, funny enough, you don't want to open the barrel more than is necessary. So this goes back to oxygen and being in. Uh, every time you open your bung, air is going to rush in. And if you've ever pulled a bung off a sealed barrel, it makes like a, like a, like a, that type of noise. And that's, it's good when it's airtight. You do need to top it though. So you open the bung to top it, air rushes in, you top it with wine to displace the air, seal it again, put it away. Well, while you have it open, you might as well taste it, smell it, test it, add KMBS if needed. But top it up, put it away. Don't touch it again for two, three, four more months when you go to top it. If you're opening your barrels every week, I wouldn't recommend doing that because every time you open it, you're getting oxygen in and it's, it's just, it's not good. So, you know, top every few months, don't open it more than is necessary. But when it is open, you might as well check it, you know, sensorially, chemically, all you can. Taste it. Always a good time to taste when, you, when your barrel's open. So topping legal issues. This is something I've been trying to look up and I, I can't find anything on it. But currently, as far as I know, there are no topping or blending laws for wine, for wine in Oklahoma, um, which means you can top any barrel with any wine and still call it anything you want. And you see how can that, you can run into, you can run into some problems there. There are topping laws elsewhere, not only in the United States, but worldwide. Similar topping laws only allow for 25% of a different variety to be used, and then only 5% of a different vintage. And I, I think those are good, because let's say you have a 2020 Chamberson wine in a barrel. Well, it's naturally going to deplete with time. It's best to top it with Chamberson, but if you can't, you know, maybe use Norton, I don't know. But you know, where's the line? Because if I'm topping half a barrel, if I have half a barrel of Chamberson and I'm topping it with half a barrel of Norton, is it still Chamberson anymore? I, not in my opinion. And you need to establish laws on this to, to say what you can and can't do. Because if, if, if you can allow you to top with anything, then who's to say where the line is on what's a blend and what's a, what's a bridle anymore? And uh, the laws I've seen only allow for 25% of a different variety and only 5% of a different vintage. Um, if there are laws on Oklahoma topping, blending laws for wines in Oklahoma, I, I don't, I'm unaware of them. I would like to know them. And if there's not any laws, I think 
that should be established that there should be some, just, just my opinion. Next one. Uh, barrel reconditioning. So back to what I kind of spoke of before, barrels do wear out over time and they become neutral. Once they become neutral, you can recondition them to revitalize them a little bit. That requires breaking them down, disassembling, cleaning the staves, you know, whether it be blasting or scraping, you want to clean the staves as best you can, expose new fresh wood, um, reassemble it, re retoast it, and then you can, you can get some new life, maybe two or three more uses out of it. Uh, because the, the fresh wood is the key to imparting oak flavors or attributes or aromas. Um, there are companies on the West Coast that do this. So if you do have barrels, maybe 10, 20 neutral barrels, you're like, man, I wish I had some fresh oak, but I don't want to buy new barrels. You can actually truck those barrels to the West Coast. A company will break them all down, clean them, reassemble them, retoast them, and send them back to you at a fraction of the cost. And now you have, you know, 10, 20 new barrels, for more or less of a better word. Um, so barrel reconditioning is something you can do. Okay, oak alternatives, which brings me to alternative oak. Um, Alternative oak is a way to incorporate oak into wine without using the traditional oak barrel means. Um, since oak barrels are wood, you know, and wood is oak, and they're all essentially the same, you can drop, you can have oak chips, oak blocks, spirals, zigzags, cubes, you know, staves, uh, sticks. You can incorporate this oak into your wine to simulate barrel aging. It's usually less expensive and takes up less space. Um, and it's also, at, uh, it's faster extraction. The smaller the oak chip, the faster the extraction. So putting 60 gallons of wine into an oak barrel is not the same, well, time-wise, putting 60 gallons of wine into an oak barrel versus putting oak into 60 gallons of wine, that oak into the 60 gallons of wine will extract faster. You see, uh, that's the oak alternatives. You're putting oak into wine rather than putting wine into oak barrels. Um, again, it's all the same species of oak. It's all a tree that grew from the earth. It's just a different way to do it. Uh, and I've used oak alternatives before. I think they're fine. I think they're wonderful. They, they work well. You just have to watch them. You know, you can't, you can't just leave chips in a tank for six months. You might over oak it. So just, just be cautious. Um, alternative oak with micro-oxygenation. Like I said, the smaller the oak, the faster the extraction. There's also something called a micro-oxygenation machine, or micro-ox for short. So like I mentioned, a traditional oak barrel will allow tiny amounts of oxygen into the wine over time, naturally. And it picks up oak, it picks up a little bit of oxygen, it improves color and tannin structure. If you're using alternative oak, you can also use something called a micro-ox machine which intentionally doses small oxygen into the wine. Be careful though, because too much oxygen will spool wine and it's, you know, it's kind of like playing with fire. But this machine on the bottom right corner, it's a microwax machine. And that, that's a little, that's a pure oxygen canister. I think it's pure oxygen uh, canister. And then those hoses is, is just a porous membrane and you would drop that into a tank or to a barrel. Well, I guess maybe not a barrel, unless it's neutral. Um, and it, it doses oxygen into the wine. And I kind of use the analogy that a traditional oak barrel is like a crock pot. Wait, it's like a crock pot uh, that you, a traditional oak barrel is like slow cooking on a crock pot for six hours. Um, using alternative oak is kind of like a microwave oven. And then using micro ox is like a microwave. You see like one's really fast and quick can get the job done. A nice oven roast is good, but then you have like your slow crock pot that you've been going for six, seven hours. That's really good too. That's just the analogy I use. I don't know how accurate that is, but they, they do affect the wine. I don't know. It, there's a lot of debate if it, if it really affects it differently or not, or if it's good or if it's worth it, but just be careful. If you're going to use micro oxygenation, don't over spoil your wine. You know, don't create VA. Um, nothing wrong with, with doing it. It's just a different way to do it. Okay. Uh, further reading, just if you're curious, I've read this book before. I like it a lot. It's about 200 pages. It's called Wood, Whiskey, and Wine 
a history of barrels. Um, it, it just tells you everything about barrels uh, in both wood and whiskey. I, I love it. I use some of their some of their stuff here in this PowerPoint. Um, it's a good book. It's just it's fun. Uh, it, it's really in depth and it, it tells a lot about about wine and and oak barrels. So. Okay, that brings me to the end. I'll open it up now for for questions. Uh, let me stop my recording. I thank you all uh, for listening and sharing and watching. So let me stop the recording and I will open it up to questions.